the reason you want to read this book is how do you want to f- discover that loan shop? Do you want to discover it by opening a press release and finding out that your competitor has developed some new crazy idea that's going to kill your business? Our next guest is a second generation physicist with a PhD from Stanford University. He was a consultant with McKinsey for three years before co-founding an entrepreneurial biotechnology company. He led that company's stock market listing and was the CEO for 13 years. His most recent venture is his book, Loon Shots, which was an immediate Wall Street Journal bestseller. Loon Shots is about how to nurture crazy ideas that win wars, cure diseases, and transform industries. The book has major implications for anyone wanting to start a new and innovative business. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Safi Bokol. So Safi, why should anybody read your book? And particularly, why should entrepreneurs read your book? So the book is called Loon Shot. So Loon Shot is a crazy idea that ends up transforming your business or your industry. And the key question, the reason you want to read this book is, how do you want to f- discover that loan shop? Do you want to discover it by opening a press release and finding out that your competitor has developed some new crazy idea that's going to kill your business? Or do you want to discover it when you know one or two young folks on your team come and tell you about this new idea that's getting traction? In other words, you'd rather discover a loan shot internally than discover it externally like a bullet coming to your head. So that's why you need to read this book. Okay. It's a bit like if you're going to be cannibalized, do it yourself rather than have somebody do it for you. I'd rather not be cannibalized at all. <laughs> this, this is a good thing. This, nurturing loon shots should be, and it's supposed to be fun. Oh, in, indeed it is. Indeed it is. I was really more reflecting on, on so many companies that don't do that. And then in the, eventually they get taken over or the, the industry changes completely, you know. The well celebrated Polaroid examples, for instance, and uh, you know, they were in a good position, but chose not to take advantage of the opportunities at the time. Yeah, so I think I was thinking of some movies that I'd seen about and going the more graphic cannibalization. But yes, oh, yeah. the business. No, we won't go there. No, we won't go there. Now, what was your biggest aha moment when you started your entrepreneurial and what actually caused that process? Well, I had a sort of an unusual career that I had a couple of different careers. Being an entrepreneur was probably my third pass. I was Mm -hmm. an academic for many years, a scientist. Then I was in the consulting world in a company called McKinsey and uh, based out of New York. And I think at some point towards the, after I'd been at McKinsey a few years, I, I think I just thought about what I was doing bigger picture with my life. If you're Mm -hmm. an academic, you do you have a noble goal a noble pursuit you're trying to discover truth uh i moved into the business world because i felt a little constrained in a narrow area of academics that i was in i grew up in a family of scientists and i wanted to see the rest of the world and in consult it was fascinating a lot of very interesting problems and strategies and skills you need to succeed in business that are not really there in the academic world but in consulting you're focus is in making large companies more successful. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do, especially as I saw some friends of mine around me getting sick, I wanted to see what I could do that could help, what I could do personally that could help a broad range of people. And I think it, it especially resonated when my own father got sick and eventually passed away from cancer from a rare type of leukemia. And I just thought the idea of working on something, the idea of coming into work every morning, knowing that what you do might give people more time on earth with their loved ones was just a very powerful, Mm -hmm. satisfying feeling. And it I find that very motivating. I find it very easy to motivate other people with that goal. And in some sense, it's, it's a little selfish. It's just a, it was much more satisfying for me to be involved in building something like that than to be involved in a large company. 
Would you equate that to um, this, this concept of following your passion? And, and, and I got some misgivings about those words, I might add, but I'd be interested to see your, your, your take on that. I don't know. I also, what's your misgivings on the whole follow the passion? Um, my misgivings are that um, it puts a quite, quite a big hurdle on, on many people. Because it's, if you look at um, the statistics, say about, about, about 5 to 10% of people really know what they want to do when they're young, as to what they want to do when they grow up. Um, I guess you would call that an, 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 a form of uh, a measurement of how you measure passion. There's a lot of other people who aren't necessarily passionate about something, but still want to do the entrepreneurial thing. And they kind of, and by being told, follow your passion, but I don't have a passion, therefore I can't be an entrepreneur. But you can be really interested in something. It may not be your passion, but you don't want to do something boring either. That's, that's my misgiving. It's, to me, it puts a hurdle in front of a lot of people who otherwise may go down their journey. I, I agree. I think passion is a, is one of those words that has become overused and so it's almost meaningless. It's kind of, what do you really mean by passion? There's a lot of ways to define it. I mean, um, <laughs> you could be passionate for chocolate, that doesn't mean you should be eating chocolate all the time as your career or even exactly. making yeah. chocolate. I mean, it's it just a kind of a weird phrase. Mm. I, I think it's important to find, s different people are motivated by different things, mm. first of all. So I don't think there's a generic, answer and that's okay different people are different so that's why one rule doesn't let everybody i think there's a lot of people who are motivated by the feeling that they are making progress towards an important goal and that they see their own skills getting better and that they see that as their skills get better they can move the ball down the field farther towards that important goal and that in and of itself is very satisfying and if you feel that that seems to me to be a good thing a good reason to keep going so for me the kind of north star or the guiding the guiding principle i used was more follow my curiosity rather mm -hmm. than follow my passion if i yeah that makes a lot myself, of sense yeah it, 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 that particular principle was the result of uh, led to me making a number of important changes in my life. When I was in one area of science and I was very curious about it in the beginning, I had learned it, I'd mastered it, it was exciting. When, I, when that learning curve plateaued or sort of leveled off and I find myself each day just sort of turning, turning the wheel a little bit, but not really all that curious about where I was going, that was sort of a gut check. Hmm. If I'm not curious, why am I here? And then I would jump into something that I really didn't know much about, but was curious, whether it was a different area of science or, you know, be, even being a consultant. I was curious what consultants do. I couldn't figure that out. I asked 50 people, including all the people I interviewed with, you know, what do you actually do during the day? I could not figure out what a consultant is. You know, you, you, you put your butt in it, you, you get up, you get out of bed, you get in the car, you drive to work, you park, you put your butt in the office chair, and then what happens? I just yeah. couldn't visualize it. What's next? <laughs> I don't understand what that job is. So I, I partly took the job out of curiosity. I just couldn't figure out what people, why would people pay these otherwise untrained people? But, uh, and then when I had kind of figured out the answer to that, and I was curious about what it would be like to build something of my own and to um, build something from scratch and how do you do that, then that was just time for another shift. So mm. for me, it's been more about following my curiosity rather than following passion. And I, I, I don't even quite know what that means since I am passionate for, you know, peanut butter ice cream, but I don't <laughs> do that as a career. Um, so I understand you, you launched, after your consulting, you started thinking about, uh, you launched a biotech company. Um, what were the challenges that you found in the startup phase that uh, you came across and how did you manage to traverse those? Um, well, there's an enormous number. I think probably every entrepreneur uh, who starts off, I was in my early 30s when I started, mm -hmm. and probably like 
the vast majority of first time entrepreneurs I made probably every possible mistake. Um, so I think that's yep. by far the, the norm rather than the exception, especially when people are kind of honest about their histories. Uh, I, you know, there were some that were in the category of things that I did, things that I had to learn and realize as a manager or leader that I didn't know when I first started that were important lessons that usually I learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some things that were you know, pretty specific to the challenges of doing the type of startup that I did, which was working with people at a university, you know, a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of different uh, inventors, a whole bunch of different founders, a whole bunch of different existing people and trying to herd all those cats together. Um, that herding of many, many strong-willed cats in and of itself has all sorts of interesting challenges. Massive challenges, absolutely. The personality, yeah, so, the interests, the, the, the turf territory uh, debates have come into all these sorts of things as well. Uh, yeah, so all, all of those were challenges. Um, you have to, uh, you know, fortunately you have the energy for that in your 30s. I'm not sure I would have the same energy for that in my 50s, uh, which is why so many, you know, early entrepreneurs are younger. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, 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 down, the, the advantage is that you have the energy and the interest to really tackle those problems when you're, you know, a little bit younger. Um, but you often don't have the wisdom on the insights on the people, yeah. insights in, um, well, mostly the people insights, certainly some of the business judgment, but uh, there's a lot of people insight stuff that only comes with time and with age and with experience. Yeah, and I guess it's, a, it's that layering in of those sorts of things and cumulatively you actually, you, you make a big jump over time. And I guess many of those things, uh, yeah. mentors can help you. They can certainly, and coaches can help you and guide you in the direction. But some of those things you really do need to experience for yourself because it's different how we experience the world is different for everyone. Is that what you found? Yeah, and I, I think people underestimate how important failure is because mm -hmm. especially early failures, if they can be contained, they're yeah. Catastrophic, uh, because with success, it's very hard to separate luck from skill. Yeah. And people tend to assume it was their own skill when very often it was luck. And sometimes they succeeded despite themselves. And the problem with that, if you have those kind of early successes, is that you develop massive blind spots and flaws because you think, oh, well, it was a good outcome, so I should keep doing what I was doing. Well, you had a good outcome in part because you were lucky and uh, a bunch of things, you know, a bunch of cards came up your in your favor. Um, and some part was skill, but it's very hard, especially if you're a little younger, to tell the difference. Mm. The advantage of failure is that usually you know what you did <laughs> that caused something <laughs> and it causes you to think about what should you do differently next time so you learn a lot more from in general you learn a lot more from failures and from successes some people who are very good at something i think of as system mindset which is understanding the system and the processes by which they themselves make decisions um, which I talk about a little bit in the book, um, those people who have conditioned themselves to analyze their successes as critically as they analyze their failures and look for the patterns of why they entered into a decision. Hmm. Whether, whether it was a good outcome or a bad outcome, they try to separate the quality of the decision from the outcome. And then they try to identify what triggers or patterns are behind bad decisions and what triggers or patterns are behind good decisions and they try to shift more towards the good decisions. So that, that's sort of a higher level of 
strategy or even self strategy in how if it's just yourself and if it's a team or a small team that's a higher level of strategy of at the end of a let's say you launch a product or you have a big milestone you don't just do a postmortem which is reasonably common you know what happened and what was the act but you do a postmortem not just on the outcome oh did we succeed because few customers like this product and it was the competitors didn't have that feature and we had this other feature and that's why we work. That's a, a good thing to do, but it's a medium level of strategy and under analysis and mindset. The much higher level of strategic thinking and mindset that helps you much more broadly is, well, we succeeded or failed with this launch. Let's say it was because, you know, this product didn't have this feature. It didn't perform as we thought we would. A competitor's feature was better, and that's why customers were using it. Mm -hmm. Not just, oh, okay, we should think about that next version should have that feature improved. That's sort of the medium level. But how did we decide to launch at that time with that product, with that feature set? Who was responsible for thinking through the competitive analysis, feature by feature? Do we have a checklist? Do we have a competitive analysis? Did we have it and just ignore it? Or did we not even have one in place? Or did somebody do it, but was too afraid to tell the leader or the manager of the team? So that's called a system mindset. That's the mm -hmm. highest level. The reason that's so powerful is because the first one, the medium level, will help you with the one feature. You'll fix it in your next version. But the higher level, how did we arrive at the decision to launch? Who is, are, do we have a checklist? Is there, are these items on the checklist? How is the information being communicated? How is the decision being made? That level of thinking can prevent you from failures in a thousand different situations, uh, not yes. just one feature. So you can think of that, or what I call that is sort of a system mindset versus an outcome mindset. And the best teams and entrepreneurs have a system mindset, not only for their companies, but for themselves. How did I arrive at this decision? But so much innovation is actually in the space of process. And so little is well written about that. I mean, some people do, you obviously do. And I can see a lot of the things you've been mentioning have big themes within the book, uh, Loonshot. Do you want to just un unpack that a little bit about the, the systems and the, the process of how, uh, teams interact with one another to get the, these outcomes. Yeah, and that, that was one of the original motivations for getting into this was that when I first started as a manager or entrepreneur, um, I read probably like every young person starting out at anything you can find about how to be a better leader, how to build a better company, more empowered employees and deliver on all these big dreams we had. And almost everything I read was about culture, culture, culture. Mm -hmm. And the first few things, you know, celebrate victories, empower your employees, you know, treat people with respect and so on. Um, those are all good things to do. It's better to treat people with respect than punch them in the face. Um, but after a while, I was looking for some harder science, not just the sort of squishy psychology stuff. And I noticed that this sort of odd thing that companies would talk about how great their culture was and they'd be doing well and then all of a sudden they'd collapse. And the same companies that were glorified for their wonderful culture, whether it was Nokia or Blackberry or even Enron, were then in the garbage bin. But the culture hadn't changed. It's the same people. So what changed? And that led me to thinking about structure, which is what are the designs and incentives and kind of underlying forces that drive people? And so here's, here's what I mean by that. I'll give you a, a, a simple an analogy with a glass of water. In a glass of water, you could stick your finger in and slosh it all around. And that's true for any liquid. It, all the molecules are just sloshing around. And you can think of that sloshing around as the pattern of behavior. When I change temperature, all of a sudden that pattern of behavior completely changes. When I cross 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, all of those sloshing molecules suddenly line up completely rigidly. 
So why do they suddenly change behavior? There isn't a CEO molecule giving them a lecture or forcing them to watch videos about how they should change behavior, you know, and checking the temperature and saying, now do this. Something else is underneath, and that something else is temperature. At high temperatures, there's underlying forces. There are always two forces. One force that wants to make these molecules run around and be free, and another force that wants to lock every molecule rigidly in place at a certain distance, 2.8 angstroms, not 2.7, not 2.9, from its neighbor. And as you vary temperature, the relative strength of those two forces changes. And at 30, 32 Fahrenheit, at zero Celsius, the relative balance flips and it favors locking in place rather than running around and being free. So it did occur to me that so many people talk about culture, but almost no one is talking about structure. What are the kind of individual incentives or forces? What are the two things that influence people inside teams and companies? And how does the design of the organization and design of incentives affect the balance of those two things? And the more I thought about that, the more I realized, the more I pulled on that thread, the more I discovered, whoa, well, there really are these two forces. And as you change certain parameters of the company, let's say as a company grows, the balance between these two forces shift, and at a certain size, boom. Incentives start favoring kind of politics and promotion and career rather than embracing wild new ideas. And I realized that that kind of framework and model um, and underlying the language is actually a mathematics. You can kind of write that down just like you do for water. And you can see qualitatively and quantitatively how the balance of these forces shift as a company grows. And more importantly, you see how you can control that, just like with water. For example, although water will always freeze when you lower the temperature, it's not always at 32 Fahrenheit. If you sprinkle a little salt, what happens? Well, you lower the, you weaken the binding energy, which means you make it less easy for them, less likely for them to want to line up and more likely for them to run around which means you lower the freezing point, which is why you sprinkle salt on your sidewalks after it snows, because you want to lower the free, you want it to, you want to lower the freezing point. You want the water to slosh around rather than freeze up and turn into ice. So those are the little tweaks, the small changes to structure, adding a little bit of salt or another example is uh, iron. If you draw raw iron out of the ground, it's actually a very weak metal. But if you sprinkle a little carbon into it, it turns into solid steel. And if you sprinkle a little cobalt and nickel, it turns into the ultra strong alloys used inside jet engines and nuclear reactors. So those are the small changes in structure and systems. Those are examples of those small changes in structure. And as it turns out, you can identify the similar or the analogous small changes in structure in teams and companies. What is the analogy of sprinkling a little bit of salt into the team? What are the small design changes that can give you more innovative teams and companies? And you do that by understanding the forces. You know, everyone thinks about culture and it's about how the CEO treats people and how people treat people. But the thing that they're missing is that everybody in a team or company has two types of incentives. Two types of incentives. And that happens whenever you organize a group into a team or a company or even a nation where there's a mission and a reward system tied to that mission. As soon as you do that, you create two forces. And here's what those two forces are. The first one is you can think of as stake and outcome. You put 10 people together into a company, let's say developing a cancer drug or whatever it is, some kind of product. Well, everybody may own, let's say 10% of that outcome. It's pretty high. If the, if the product works, everyone may be a billionaire or well, maybe not a billionaire, but at least a millionaire and a hero. And if it fails, everyone's unemployed and looking for a job. So your stake and outcome is pretty huge. 
If you have 10 people, there's probably one person who's the team captain. If, you know, team captain will make a few thousand dollars more, let's say, in salary than the other people, but that's nothing compared to the millions at stake from making that product succeed. So your two forces are perks of rank and stake and outcome. So when you're small, stake and outcome is huge and perks of rank are sort of irrelevant. Now flip that around and imagine a really huge company, 100,000 people. Well, your stake and outcome might be less than a tenth of a percent. If you're working on a coffee machine design for some giant conglomerate, even if your coffee machine is the best coffee machine in the world, it might move the needle by less than a fraction of a percent. But if you could play politics well and sound smart in meetings and suck up to your boss well, you could get promoted. And then you might make 20 or 30% bump in salary. So when it becomes very large, when the companies become very large, careers and promotion and politics matter a lot more. So your incentives are flipped. And somewhere between the two, there's the equivalent of zero degrees centigrade, the freezing, where all of a sudden you shift from embracing those wild new ideas and uniting around them because everybody's got a ton of stake and outcome to focusing on politics and career and promotion. So that's in some sense the underlying theme of uh, Loon Shots, why groups of people will suddenly change from embracing wild new ideas to rigidly rejecting them, just like a glass of water will change from flowing liquid to rigid solid, and what you can do about that. So is there any large companies that you've looked at or come across that have resisted that that shift from uh, in, in sense of the outcome to the in sense of the state or the uh, the position in the company? Would it be if anybody, everybody in the company were, like a, for instance, a shareholder, uh, an employee-owned company, for instance? Does that happen yeah, well, as well? Well, there's two things to keep in mind. Generally speaking, stock options are worthless. They're an example of uh, in large companies. Well, let's say you're, you're seven layers down from the CEO and you're working on a coffee machine and you get granted a, you know, a handful of stock options. So what? I mean, your coffee machine design isn't going to move the needle of that stock option. Mm -hmm. So you have what e economists call a free rider problem. You might as well twiddle your thumb and play solitaire and chat with your friends on instant message while you convince your boss that you're indispensable because then you know, if the company does well, your stock, your stock options grow. If the company does poorly, well, at least you've had some fun time with your friends. Either way, it doesn't make it that you're, it's a win-win. Hmm. So those stock options don't actually do much for you. Uh, and that, that is a big problem in corporate America since that's a common problem. So that, that's just one thing. But the second thing is that you don't want everybody to be wildly innovative. No, that's true too. You want both. So for example, yeah. let's start with the military. I was just talking with a senior military leader. You do want experiments and risk-taking when you're working on crazy new weapons. You want to try lots of stuff and see what might fail. You want to experiment and come up with the next new technology before your enemy does. It's the same in business. On the other hand, as he pointed out, if you're in charge of a nuclear missile silo, you don't want to be doing a lot of experiments. Mm -mm. Let's see which buttons I press that yeah. launch this thing. What happens that's here? how we'll find out which one works. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. that's really not what you want to do no. if you are managing a nuclear missile silo. Same thing if you're building planes. You don't want to launch, you know, if you're an artist, if you're exploring new technologies, you want to try 10 things and see which nine fail and then go with the one that works. That's how you know you're pushing the boundaries. But if you're manufacturing planes, you don't want to launch 10 in the sky sit back and see, well, let's just see which nine crash and we'll keep the one good one. So you want actually both the solid and the liquid. And the, what you need to do is find the balance between the two. Mm -hmm. How do you create an equilibrium situation? So if you're in a large group, what you want to do is create the only situation in nature in which the two things can coexist, solid and liquid. Because normally a system can't, water can't be solid and liquid at the same time. It doesn't make any sense. The only exception is right on the edge of a phase transition, life at zero Celsius. Because then 
you get sort of separation, you get blocks of ice and pools of liquid and they separate. And that's what you want. Let's say in the military, you want the soldiers reducing risk. You want to go on battles with the least amount of risk possible, with the highest accuracy, you want redundancy and hierarchy and quality control. If you or I were soldiers and someone told us that's a high risk battle, that's not a good thing. You want it the lowest risk. But if you're an artist or a scientist working on crazy ideas, and you say, well, you've really de-risked your art. Well, that's kind of a terrible insult. You actually want the most risks taking in that group. So what you want to do is you want to separate your artists and soldiers, create different systems and different incentives for each because you're trying to incentivize different things, and then manage the transfer between the two because the two speak totally different languages. Oh, and that's they do. That's the failure because like even just the word risk, it's a bad thing for a soldier, but it's a great thing for an artist. So it's the same language, but it has two totally different meanings. Mm. So the companies that have been most successful have kind of followed some of these principles, which I outline a little bit in mm. the book, but essentially they separate their artists and soldiers. That's kind of easy. A lot of people do that, create innovation labs, let's say. The hard part is managing the transfer between the two, resisting yeah. the temptation to dive, you know, leaders to dive too deep into A or B, but really focus on the biggest failure point, which is soldiers don't have a lot of incentives and don't care for and don't like spending the incredible amount of time that's required to understand the artists and translate it into their language. So you have to work on that transfer. And then most things fail the first time and they don't have a lot of incentive to take time out of their day when they could be selling stuff or making stuff that's important and that is what they're measured on to go back to the artists and say, well, here's the 37 things you need to fix. Let me walk you through that. And then the artist starts whining. You just don't understand. And the soldier's like, well, let me tell you about my customer or, my, or what it's like on the battlefield. And like, no, I don't care about you. You know, then it's just, you know, it's just a headache, which yeah. is why that's the failure point for most innovation. So the key ends up being separating your artists and soldiers, managing the transfer, not the technology, and learning to love and appreciate both groups equally. Not that one is better or worse than the other, but you need both. So that, that ends up, the companies that do the best job at that are the ones that essentially follow those three big picture principles. Yeah, it's getting that, that friction point between the two, and it usually is a friction point, yeah. and, and transitioning that in the whole commercialization process. That yeah. takes, takes it out of the lab into the, into the production side of things. I get the structural argument you, you, you post, put in the book and, and, and in, the, in, in the interview. One of the things that often uh, bothers uh, in, in individual entrepreneurs is how do you do that within yourself or within small entrepreneurial teams? How do you get that, that being on both sides of that equation, yet not too much of one or the other, is straddle that you know, a very delicate zero degree or 32 degree Fahrenheit line. Sure. Um, and I had exactly that. Yeah. I had exactly that question when we were a two person startup, even a 10 person startup, or even now as a writer, uh, you're just, you're a solo entrepreneur. Mm. So you can't say, well, you be an artist and you be a silly. You just don't have that number of people. When you are too small to separate those two types by role, what you want to do is separate those two types in time. So what I mean by that is wearing two different hats. And I physically have two hats, my artist hat and my soldier hat. Mm -hmm. and what that means is that most of the time I'm wearing my soldier hat. When I was solo entrepreneur or a small company entrepreneur, we had, to, we had our priorities and we just had to get things done on time, on budget, on spec, on a daily or weekly level to deliver it. That's your soldier hat. But periodically, whether it was one afternoon a week or, you know, a, a, a couple of one weekend a month or a week a year, I would take off uh, the soldier hat either for me or for our small team. And I say, all right, soldier hats off, ready to put on your artist hat. And now the rules are flipped 180. You need to have as many bad ideas as possible, as fast as possible. Yeah, and don't challenge them at the time. Get the inner critic, 
forget the risk management, mm -hmm. forget the risks. Yeah. Just create supply as many ideas as fast as possible. And the only rule is that you can build on each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. You can't describe risks. So now you're being an artist. You're be trying to come up with as many crazy ideas as possible in a fixed period of time. And towards the end of that week or afternoon or whatever it is, you say, all right, artist hat off, soldier hat back on. Now let's identify how we're going to prioritize the you know, 57 ideas we came up with or whatever and pick three of them that might be the best for whatever reasons we feel. And that gives us a new, a new direction. And now as soldiers, we're going to march along that direction for the next chunk of time until you again, let's say you deliver on your milestones, you deliver things on time, on budget, and you next do your artist. So what you're doing, your artist session, so you're, what you're doing is you're, you are trying to create a balance, but in time rather than by role of person. And if you, the key to doing that is being self-aware and being mindful of what hat you're wearing. For example, if you as a leader have a very small team, even if you're by yourself and you are bombarding them with let's get stuff done on time and budget and who has 10 new ideas and let's get this stuff done, you're driving them crazy and they're going to hate you. <laughs> and you're going to hate yourself. You're just going to be very frustrated because you don't know which hat you're wearing. Are you wearing the let's come up with all sorts of crazy ideas hat? Or are you wearing the let's be, let's reduce risk hat? Let's get things done on time on budget. So you need to know how to, if you're a solo or a small company, you need to understand how to put on those different hats and be clear with people which hat you're wearing, which hat they're wearing, and be clear which block of time is carved out for what. It's a bit like being a, like a schizophrenic type of arrangement, isn't it? You're flipping from one and ignoring the other one and then flipping it back. How do you do that in a, uh, if, if, you, if, you're going, if you're wearing your soldier hat, right? And you're in the, in the, in the, in the business of actually development and, and creation of the, of the final product and delivering it, and things go wrong along the way. How do you manage that time shift that you um, can flip back into the into into the creative side? So it's not structured in that sense. It is something you need to do because it happens. It's forced upon you almost. Yeah, let's say you're <clears throat> managing a, a space shuttle flight and something breaks down and you need to improvise a solution. Hmm. Um, it's controlled schizophrenia. You need to manage, you need to be on top of it. You know, the disease or the pathology is when it's uncontrolled. But you need to, if you're a, a manager or a leader, you're just not going to be effective if you're only A or B. If you can only be a soldier, eventually your competitors are going to pass you by because they'll come up with something more creative than you. If you're only going to be a creative artist and can't get stuff to customers on time, on budget, on spec, you'll be out of business. So I, it's not really a choice. If you want to succeed, you have to master both or at least master the uh, principle of having both hats and being self-aware and mindful of which hat you're wearing when. Can we talk a bit about collaborative teams? It's a very popular term. Um, I'm not sure how well it happens at the moment. There's lots of people talking about it, but it has its own structural issues around that. Is, do you have any, any in, insight into how you might manage a collaborative team where you have lots of, hats, you have lots of cats to herd with their, own, um, with their own potential businesses to run and you come to get together and then you jointly do something? Uh, but it's not instructed within a single company. It's m much a looser affair. Yeah, you, you mean you're talking about collaborations, internal, external. Yes. Yeah. I mean, in, in my industry, in drug discovery, that's the standard. That's really the rule rather than the exception. You often work with scientists at academic labs 
in addition to scientists inside your own company mm -hmm. and they have to collaborate. So it's, you have to do that all the time. I think they're, they're, basic principles that are pretty well understood for pe people who've been doing that a while. You need to have, again, in some sense, both skills. You need to be encouraging the artistic creativity, especially if you're working with, let's say, scientists in a lab or working creative artists in some design shop or the people that you're parting partnering with are sort of the more creative types. You just want to be pretty self-aware about we need to do both things. We need to be really creative together. So let's, you know, make a timeout. And this is our super creative moment. And okay, now that's done. And now we need to focus on timelines and budgets. And the more one is upfront about that, the better it usually works. Usually if there's some person, you can't really manage that unless there's a some person calling the shots on the team, some team leader or team captain. And that the responsibility of that person is to manage that operation. And by managing that operation, I mean, not only making clear that meetings are have agendas and are run on time and expectations are clear and the right people are there and follow up is good but that the team is in the right mode at the right time. When the team needs to be creative, everybody's got the message in advance that this is creative artist time. And so there isn't the sort of nitpicking, well, that idea will never work, or that idea will never work, or that timeline will never work. You just say, all right, let's take a time out on all that. We're now being as creative and as brainstorming as we possibly can. And the same team leader has got to guide the team to say, okay, well, that creative thing is done. Now we're back to operational efficiency. And so, you know, we're not doing a lot more creative brainstorming around whether we're going to deliver this at you know, July 15th or July 29th or July, you know, we picked and we, now we just move on. So it's, it's uh, the key to success there like with the internal team is being mindful and being clear and communicating in advance. This is what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. And in terms of the rewards and the status elements that we spoke about earlier, how does that impact in a collaboration team where, again, people from different areas come together? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question because you can't necessarily control uh, incentives for external people mm -hmm. you can control incentives in your own team and company but external people will have their own agenda so the good news is that everybody knows that if you're working let's say with an academic their agenda is to publish a paper and get tenure or whatever their criteria are get grant money so the lesson is you want to be really thoughtful in advance about what people's incentives are because incentives drive behavior. If you just try to say, well, this guy's not collaborating and he's da, 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 da. Well, let's step back a second. What are his or her incentives? You know, if their incentives are to write a paper it be, it be, and not have their competitors take that, well, you don't really, let's say you're inside a company you don't really care who gets the credit for it. You just want the product. They care who gets the credit for it. Those are two totally different incentives because academics get promoted and recognized based on credit of original research. Inside a company, it's not about that. It's about delivering a product that delivers better value for your customers before your competitor does. So those are two totally different goals and incentives. So if you never think about that, you're going to have a big problem. What you want to do is say, well, before you start collaborating, how could those incentives influence our team dynamics? You know, let's say we have some external partners and some internal ones. They had very different incentives. So let's just design the system with that in mind. Just because incentives are different doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. It just means 
you need to be self-aware of that. Otherwise, you could get yourself into a lot of trouble. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's a, I'm drilling right down the rabbit hole on this. I've, I've done a lot of work with academics and, and transitioning them out of academia into, into the commercial sector. The, often I find a stumbling block. There is the, the incentive to publish, and the, it's definitely there. But the incentive to keep things secret is also there for the commercial aspect of it. And that's a really tricky situation because it, essentially you are undermining the incentive of the academic to do what it is they do. And they, but they still end up needing to collaborate because otherwise nothing will ever happen in terms of seeing their product or their idea come to fruition. You had any experience in those sorts of really tricky things? Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, the, uh, <laughs> I also ended up spending a fair amount of time helping academics transition to the mm -hmm. business world. I could, you know, I did. And there are a couple of, one that you didn't touch on is one that I found the biggest mindset shift. And that is, as an academic, you essentially are, you're working on problems more or less. You have limited resources and mm -hmm. infinite time. In business, it's the opposite. By comparison, you have infinite resources but also extremely limited time. It's the inverse problem. So academics have to, you know, the, one of the hardest things is in problem solving to go from the mode of playing chess where let me just spend four hours thinking about a move before I move my pawn to speed chess, whereas you got 80 seconds on the clock and you just have to make a move. And you, it won't be perfect because you only, but you just have to move anyway. And so yeah. that's a very... It's the same board in pieces, but the different rules make it a different game. And so the first thing was just a mindset, a mindset shift in problem solving. The second thing you mentioned on incentives um, and publishing, for example, that's to some extent that's more straightforward because it's pretty clear. Right? You know, it, academics want to publish and be recognized by their peers, companies need to keep things uh, proprietary so competitors don't get them in general. So that's actually really pretty transparent. Uh, so then you sit down, you know, in, in biotechnology, you just have sort of simple rules that you bake in that, you know, the certain ideas that come from inside the company, you know, they get patented inside the company and they can't be disclosed, but other ideas that come from there, there's a time period and the company can work on it for, you know, this, you know, per time period of X months or however long. And then the academic is free to do whatever they want and publish wherever they want. So you just meet in the middle. Uh, it's like any negotiation, you know, there's a the buyer of a house wants the lowest price and the <laughs> seller of the house wants the highest price. And you come to an agreement. Uh, you meet in the middle. The, the wrong thing is to just give somebody the keys without agreeing on the price. <laughs> you to agree on the price, sign a contract, and get it down in sort of black and white, and then move on. Um, maybe those things there are, tend to be some sort of standard solutions, because those problems are common, and people have come up with standard ways to solve them. So Safi, in the book, you talked about um, when people joined the group, um, they, they make that transition, that phase transition, relatively easily. Um, the other experiences that often people have is they go from a large group and then become a solo entrepreneur for whatever reason that is, and they find that transition into creativity very difficult to achieve. I, I would say two things to that. One, I found that's a little bit of a myth sometimes. I found that some people have a harder time than others. Other people just take to it very naturally. Um, and, you know, part of that, the example that I mentioned in the book is that it's really about the environment and it's less about the person. It's about what the environment draws out of the person. And in some sense, you, it's like the molecule of water. You take a molecule of water and you drop it in a liquid that's sloshing around and it sloshes around with all the other molecules. Same molecule, you drop it on a block of ice, and what happens? It freezes. So it's not something inherent, and a molecule isn't inherently solid or liquid. It depends on the environment. 
Mm -hmm. Same thing with people. I don't think they're inherently risk averse um, or inherently crazy risk taking with some exceptions. Of course, there's a distribution, not, you know, everybody isn't exactly the same, but I think everybody has a certain risk taking side to them and everybody has a certain conservative side to them and your incentives will create different things. So if in a big company you're fired for ever failing, guess what? No one's ever going to take any risk. Yep. Uh, in, in a small company, if everyone's unemployed when the product fails, everybody's going to do anything they can, no matter how crazy it is, to save that product. So they'll try anything. So it's the same people will behave differently depending on, uh, often depending on just their incentives. So what I found is that, of course, when you transition in the real world from one environment to another, there's a little bit of culture chalk, just like if you fly from Australia and you land in Japan, there's going to be a little bit of adaptation time. Just as good. Uh, yeah. So what I have found uh, that is helpful is to assign a friend or a mentor or a buddy to whoever's coming over who has made that jump in the past because they often uh, can understand it the best. If you're in a situation where you have enough people that you can do that, it's often easier for if you create, you know, someone new is coming in and you assign them sort of a buddy who's made that transition before, it's easier for them to go have lunch or coffee and talk through some of their issues in the transition with a peer or someone in a different group rather than with their boss mm -hmm. or with, they certainly can't, don't want to, uh, you, you don't want to put them in the situation of talking to their employees about, you know, how I don't understand how things work here. <laughs> it's much better if you can get a confidential, uh, relationship established. And, you know, one thing that's interesting is, is uh, let's say you have two CEOs, you agree and, and you don't have anybody in your own company that you think would be available. You agree to exchange, like you create buddies between the two companies. Mm -hmm. And that way they can share, uh, without sharing material information, they can share just their personal um, experiences and uh making that shift so you find two people ideally they're actually not the same they're not obviously they're not competitive companies you want in, in an ideal world they would be somewhat unrelated industries but you just find two people who have one who's new to making that jump and one who's made that jump and then match them up yeah and i you know i think the it can be a little exaggerated uh how big that transition really is you know most companies have a job and want to get the job done and the other stuff is you know there are certain patterns of behavior that you need to respect but you know let's say you need a bunch of forms filled out in a big company and you don't need those forms filled out in the small company that's not really the biggest deal in the world you, you no. get used to that pretty fast yeah so. it'll be a delight i'm sure not to fit in a bunch of forms. those are usually the benefits you know the, the yeah. problem is a sort of what I call or other people call the, you know, where's my helicopter problem when you have the big company execs come and they have to like empty their own trash and, and uh, clean their own coffee machine. Yeah. And you know, that's not the big, if they have that, if they're coming in with expecting a helicopter and a limousine, you know, you, you have whoever hired them has <laughs> made a hiring mistake. I used to take people, there's a, you know, a random, you know, this small, pretty unpretentious kind of low budget chain called Denny's mm -hmm. uh, that was there near where we worked. And I would do my interviews at Denny's. So it might be the CEO or, you know, a senior executive at some large company. And if he had a problem eating waffles and pancakes for, you know, $1.99, then maybe he really, you know, had the helicopter problem. Mm. Um, but I, I would screen for that before hiring. A big part of the book, is the the size of the group it has, where where it can work and and what stage it, the group becomes solidified and and then with the issues that you talked about, if a group is a, is the important element that is the structure side of things, 
that's where real innovation can accelerate more so than maybe at the, the smaller end of the market. Does that have implications on the entrepreneurial ecosystem? I'm talking venture capitalists, I'm talking government support programs. And allied to that, um, I recently did a, uh, I looked at the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, I think from the year 2017 or 2018, I've forgotten now exactly, looking at what countries are ranking high on entrepreneurial measures. They have a whole bunch of measures. And surprisingly to me was that many European countries did not rate very highly at all. And I was spoken, speaking to somebody else and they said, well, because a lot more intrapreneurship is happening in Europe rather than entrepreneurship, which seems to be meshing up with the uh, global entrepreneurship data. So ecosystem. Any? Yeah, I think the the lesson there is you can see in the design of industries. The, the bottom line is that you need your artists and your soldiers. You need the small and the large. And in let's say in, in the you can see that in the structure of the industry, not just in the structure of companies that companies have both. So let's take the film industry. The film industry, you have a handful of companies, let's say here in Hollywood, in, in the United States, in Hollywood, you have the Columbia, Universal, Paramount, Sony, and they make the big franchises, the Transformers, the Avengers, the Batmans, the whatever. And then you have the hundred of, hundreds of small production shops that make the crazy movies that nobody thinks will amount to much, whether it's you know, My Big Fat Greek Wedding or Juno or Slumdog Millionaire or whatever, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which who would think that a, you know, a tiny movie about very large turtles who like pizza and have swords would do well. But you know, it's billions of dollars. Mm. So those crazy ideas don't do well inside the large franchise organizations that are more solidified, but they thrive in the ecosystem of the small tiny groups that will pursue that, you know, for every Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, small idea, small company, you know, there were nine that failed. And that's how you get a, a, a sustainable industry is that you have both. So you have the pharma majors and you have the small production miners and partnerships between the two. And it's not that one is bad or one is good. The industry needs both. You need the revenue, predictable revenue, from the next Avengers or Transformers or whatever to pay for all the failures of these crazy, risky ideas. And if you didn't have those crazy, risky ideas, these guys would die because eventually people would get tired of a franchise and then it grows stale and gets old and dies. So both sides need each other. You can't just have crazy ideas because they'll bankrupt themselves. You can't just have franchises, you need both. In biotech and in drug discovery, you have the same. You have Merck, Pfizer, Novartis, the big, and a handful of others, the big giant majors. And then you have the hundreds of small biotechs, like the one that uh, I ran, that are pursuing the crazy ideas that may not do as well inside these large companies. And you need both. And so the ecosystem is set up so that you have a dynamic equilibrium between franchises the majors with the franchises and the minors with the moonshots with the crazy ideas and partnerships between both. So just what I was describing earlier on a company level or a group level, this is now at the industry, industry level, at the yeah. meta level. And so the venture capitalists help support that one ecosystem. The uh, institutional, large institutional investors help invest in the second market, the market of the majors, and you get that separation inside the industry. And that's what makes those industries sustainable. In terms of how people can reach me through my website, yep, loonshots.com, and that mm -hmm. will tell you where you can buy the book, which is pretty much anywhere online and bookstores. Uh, there's also a contact form there. Uh, in terms of things that I am reading, well, I'm partial to biographies. I just like the histories and the personalities and the characters. So I'm kind of in the middle of one on uh, Robert Goddard, who invented uh, rockets, which was kind of the ultimate loon shot. It was the idea that made the moonshot possible, but was rejected for two or three decades. And he was a fascinating 
character and it was a fascinating history. Um, I'm reading a biography of Nabokov, who I just also find it's a totally different uh, right brain or whatever side of the hemisphere is supposed to be more creative. Oh, yeah. I got <laughs> lost as well. <laughs> but uh, I just, that's just sort of different. I find him a fascinating writer and interesting to read about. Um, and uh, I was at a meeting a week ago where this sort of question came around a table of a bunch of CEOs and one well known woman CEO, uh, very distinguished career, very impressive, was asked her favorite book. And she said, Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You Will Go. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I, I, given her, her, her success and reputation, I thought that was a pretty funny answer. And yeah. so I put that on my reading list. I don't think it will take me a long, I don't think it'll be a long read. No, I don't think so. My reading list. Uh, in terms of fast, fun facts, uh, I just started this sort of social media stuff, which I never really did much before, but it's sort of, I guess, relevant nowadays if you are writing and want to get your ideas out there. Uh, so I am now on um, Twitter, which I'd never used at all before. So I, just the handle is my name, Safi Bacall. And I uh, was sort of surprised. There's a half a billion tweets that go out every day, mm-hmm. which just, you know, it's kind of a staggering fact. Staggering. <laughs> And uh, then I just discovered the most popular emoji is the one that has the smiling with the tears coming out, like laughing so hard that you have tears coming out. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Uh, So that's the, uh, I think those were your fun fact closing questions. (laughs) (laughs) Safi, I really appreciate it. Great. Glad to be uh, on your show, Hans. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.